Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio Classics, where we listen to some of our older episodes with new introductions. We got a great set this week, because I actually reached out to my Patreon supporters, and I said, hey guys, what is your favorite episode? And I got ones that I don't think I would have picked myself, and I'm and they're good ones, they're really good ones. When you've recorded 548 episodes, a lot of stuff gets lost in the shuffle, and a lot of times... When I'm scrolling through my files, looking for something, trying to do something, I'm like, what What in the world is that? I don't remember that title. What in the world? I'll have to look it up. But all of the ones that were picked for this week, right when they they just said the title, I was like, oh, I remember that episode. Because these ones really do stand out in one way or the other. I was actually given this idea by Mikhail Malone. He was actually the first one. he, He had recently said, hey, my favorite episode was... Terrare. Now, I know, I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing that still to this day. He goes, I really like that Terrare episode. And I go, oh, that is actually one of my favorites, too. And I thought about it, and I go, I'm going to let the Patreons pick this week. So, hats off to you, Mikhail. You're the one who, who started this one off. First off, when you listen to this episode, if you just want to get to the episode, you can skip past all this. This is what I feel is a perfect Dead Rabbit Radio episode. Within the course of about 30 minutes, we cover three topics in depth. In depth. A lot of times people go, hey, how come how come the show's not longer? How come you don't delve into a story more often? It's because of episodes like this. Like, I could have easily taken any one of these topics and talked about it for an hour straight, but I feel like you'd be dragging it on. The first story about the Indian temple to this day intrigues me. Like, it's one of those stories. I didn't know it was on this episode until I re-listened to it. But to th- I-, I think it probably could have could have been the headliner episode if I had thought about it. Like, the story in the Indian temple is so bizarre. Generally, I start off with smaller stories. I don't want to call them, I usually call them starter stories. And then we have the title story at the end. Uh, the Indian Temple stands on its own as being a completely bizarre story. And to this day, I still think about it. And I'm like, I wonder if they've ever opened that door. Really, really weird topic. And it stuck with me through 548 episodes. The second story is about the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Which, it's funny because listening back to it, I'm like, I don't know. It might be a bunch of zombies running around <laughs> by summertime. That didn't happen. But instead, we got COVID-19. It was like zombies, but we couldn't move. We had to stay in our houses. It was reverse zombies. They were in your house, and you couldn't get into other people's houses. A very, very interesting story. And of course, the Terrare story. I love this story. I And again, I don't want to keep patting myself too much on the back, but you get all the information you need in the however long it is, 15 minutes long. You can go out and do more research on this guy, and you'd probably find, like, a other weird, couple other weird things. But I was able to boil <laughs> boil the bones of Terrer into a delicious, pus-filled soup for us. It's an episode that I've thought about, again, where it's 400 episodes later. I still think this is a standout episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. I consider it the blueprint for what I enjoy a good Dead Rabbit Radio episode to be. A lot of times nowadays there are two stories per episode. Sometimes there's three. And I'm shocked when I listen to these old episodes and there's like three stories in them. I'm like, whoa, I I must have been able to compact stuff more. I don't know if I was better at compacting stuff in or if I let stories breathe a little more. I don't know what the balance is. Sometimes I'll do three stories, but enough with the nerd talk enough with the behind the scenes talk guys i really hope you enjoy this episode of dead rabbit radio classics episode 120 to rare the man who ate everything a temple in india holds riches and curses then are we on the cusp of a modern day zombie outbreak seriously seriously You guys are like, nothing serious, but no, no, it's an interesting one. And then we find a man who can eat anything. Yes, anything. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. This is take four spend the past hour here doing different takes it's driving me nuts mondays are actually really hard to do because i've been out of practice for a while and i'm like 
but so goes the world of podcasting. There is a guy on YouTube, not a, not a YouTuber as far as I know, but they're one of my listeners on YouTube. I love you to death, dude. And you suggested that I do a story, and I thought, oh yeah, that'd be an interesting one, because I had a vague knowledge of it. But Pawn Roll, Pawn Roll, I know, I've seen you pop up on a couple different videos. I've seen you commenting on a few of my podcast videos on YouTube. And I know you listen to the show. So when you suggested this story, you knew the torment you were about to unleash on my audience. Because I have a hard time pronouncing cities in America. And Pawn Rawl suggested a story that takes place in India. Now, the story is... <sighs> the Padman Abhaswami Temple. Okay, I'm not even going to try that one again. The Temple. And it is this... <laughs> Pawn Rawl, really, I love you, and I'm thank, thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for the suggestion. But there's this temple in India... That there's this temple in this India that there was always this legend that it was full of treasure. This is going to be a fairly short story, but there was always this tr- rumor that it was there was this treasure in in this temple. And back in uh, what was it twenty so so but, but back in 2011, the government said, you know what, we should let's go through and find out actually what's in this temple. We should catalog it because it's been there since like three A.D. And they're like, hey, you're finally getting around to it, right? Let's do this. While they were snooping around the temple, they found six hidden doors that they never knew was there. And we'll get into that in a second, because that's an interesting thing. You find these six hidden doors, and they basically label them A through F. Now, I don't think they used the English letters, but it was basically just like, this is door A, this is door B, so C, so on. But in Indian letters. And so, they start opening the doors, and they find amazing riches gold ancient gold coins diamonds gems diamond necklaces encased in gold with gems i don't know just these amazing artifacts and they're like oh my god we're rich i mean we're the government so we're rich anyways but we have this untold unheard of fortune just laying in this temple and they're opening the doors and they're like oh, like just these sparkly gold nuggets Hanging out. The gold coins are winking at him. And a little thumbs up. Finally finding them. But door B can't be opened. Door B is sealed shut. Now they were all technically sealed shut. And they were all hidden. But door B is impenetrable. And they've tried opening it several times. You know like. I, I've jiggled the knob. Whatever. They've tried seeing what's behind door B. But the problem is. Is that door B has a legend behind it. Now. Back in the 1930s, that region was super, super poor, and they were actually going there having, like, a starvation issue. Which, I mean, I guess it's just starvation. That's the issue. They didn't have enough food. Now, this is what I thought was weird, because in 2011, they said, let's go see what's in this temple. But in the 1930s, they go, hey, we're pretty sure there's a bunch of winking gold coins in that temple. Let's go in there. And for whatever reason, the first door they tried to open was door B. And, sorry, that didn't happen in 1930. That happened 100 years ago. So in 1900, the region was... Something else happened in 1930. So in in about 1900, the region's super poor and they're starving and everything like that. They go to open door B and they hear a curious sound on the other side of door B. A a sound you shouldn't hear on the other side of any door in existence. That's the sound of the ocean. And they're like, "Eh, let's not open this. Let's, Let's not go here. And they thought this door must lead to the Arabian Ocean, which actually I figured would be closer to Saudi Arabia, but apparently it's also close to India. I, they have big coastlines, but anyway, so they didn't. And then they just a bunch of people starved. I don't know why they didn't try the other doors. Maybe they didn't know the other doors were there because they were so well hidden. In the 1930s, some burglars were like, hey, dude, sometimes when I'm walking by that temple, I hear the sound of coins winking at me. So they try to open door B and a bunch of snakes jump out of the door and chase them off. Noxious snakes is the term. So a smelly snake. Or unless the word means something else that I don't know of. To this day, that door has never been opened. Door B has never been opened. And the legend is that only a cleric or a high-level saint can open it. So so break out your Final Fantasy VII saves and see if you... I don't know if there are saints in that. But anyways, break out your role-playing game. Whatever role-playing game you do, level up your saint. Try to open this door. Because they believe that it is sealed by magic. 
And unless the seal is broken, even though the door they believe can be opened with modern technology, i.e. dynamite, they think that opening the door without removing the magic will cause great catastrophe to the region. Like a giant the Arabian Ocean emptying into the middle of India. I think it's interesting because the door has the images of snakes on it. And it had the images of something else I couldn't pronounce. Again, thanks, Ponrol. And those images are associated in Indian mythology or Indian culture as being warning signs. I mentioned once before that there was a group of people who were trying to design a warning logo that could be interpreted 10 million years in the future. Because we want to bury all this nuclear waste in Nevada, but they don't want anyone stumbling across it, you know, long after we're gone and opening the doors and irradiating the entire western half of the United States. So they go, what type of image can we come up with that millions of years from now people will not interpret as anything other than dangerous? A skull, a lot of times that represents uh, religious so if archaeologists in the future stumbled across a giant skull in the middle of a desert on a door, they may not necessarily equate that with death. For the most part, it hasn't been equated with death. For, for a long time in human history, skulls meant uh, rebirth or religion. But they're saying that this is a warning, do not open this door. I think that's really interesting because who knows what's behind it? Is it more gold? Diamonds? The size of an infant? Is it something, is it some magical portal to somewhere else? Is it a super weapon that was hidden there? Or is it just an empty room? We don't know. And it's funny because the Indian government is in no hurry to figure it out. So that is the story of the temple I can't pronounce. Indiana Jones and the temple I can't pronounce. There, you know, what's so funny is as intriguing as the story is, it de- delves a lot into Indian mythology, and I just can't pronounce the words. And I'm not going to put you through that. So we're leaving India. We'll probably be back to India at some point because they do have a, a lot of like cool mythology. It's just it's the the language barrier. I just can't pronounce that stuff, and I don't like to give foreign places nicknames like. Padaha Mata Tapta Castle. We'll just call it Paddy. I don't like to do that. But anyways, so we're off. Now, we're going from India and the legends involving that to Africa, modern day Africa. Now we're in the Congo. Now, this is an interesting story because this just popped up in the news. They're having an Ebola outbreak again. It's not just any Ebola outbreak. This is the second biggest Ebola outbreak in history. Now, They've had them, and it's been fairly restricted to villages. And they go, okay, and that's not like a good thing. Not like, yay, just villages. But it could have been a lot, lot worse. And the problem is, is that it we might be there now. Because they have this city. It's called Butembo in the Congo. And it has a population, it's a city. It has a population of over a million people. And Ebola has not hit a major city yet. And we're starting to see outbreaks in the suburbs, and in outlying communities. Ebola, if you don't know, is incredibly contagious and has a kill rate between 50% and 90%. It can be transmitted through a drop a drop of sweat or blood. So people riding on the subway, they're sweaty. And you just want to stay away from them anyways, but they're like, <laughs> shaking their head like a dog. It's flying everywhere. It's like Beethoven, but Ebola infected. And it can take up to nine days before you start to become symptomatic. So you can have it and spread it and not know it. And then you start pooping out blood. Basically, you liquefy from the inside out. That's what ends up killing you. You'll start to get like, some, some people get rashes. Some people get bloodshot eyes. Some people, it starts off with confusion and things like that, but the end result that will kill you is massive blood loss. Your organs liquefy, and then you throw up and you poop out blood until you die. It's very brutal. I've seen some photos of people dying from it. It's, it's, they're alive. You, I saw a photo of a guy sitting in the middle of a street, and just blood all on the ground underneath his butt. He's laying down, he's sitting but you just see a puddle of blood because he's pooping out blood and he's reaching out for help and everyone else in the photo is have, has given him like a 10-foot radius because he's dead. There's nothing you can do. And part of the problem is not only is Ebola highly contagious, but the burial rituals in the Congo and in other regions of this area, they require the people to clean the body, to wash the bodies off. And if they're a very famous person... 
Sometimes you'll lay on the body and be like, oh yeah, Elvis, such such great music. Let me lay on your body, which gives you Ebola. And then you die, and then your loved ones cl- wash your body, clean your body, things like that. I read an interesting article where the person says, imagine having a millennial old tradition, and all of a sudden, a couple guys show up in hazmat suits and say, just throw it in a bag and burn it. And that's the problem they're having over in these regions. They've been having these burial practices for hundreds, hundreds of years. And now people are showing up in pretty much spacesuits saying, no, can't say goodbye. Just throw it in a bag. That's it. Can't touch it. Now it's hitting a city. Like I said, it's on the outskirts. It hasn't gotten to the main part of town. But it seems like it's only a matter of time. And here's the problem. Merrick, the group that makes the... Ebola, it's an experimental Ebola vaccine, so they're not entirely for sure that it works. They're pretty sure that it works. They give it to people, and it seems to work, but they've only dealt with basic, quote-unquote, minor outbreaks. The biggest outbreak was around 11,000 people. So they go, okay, well, let's stockpile 300,000 doses of this vaccine. It takes months to prepare. They go 300,000, that, that, that's a good starting point. But with over a million people in the city, it's not even half that can be vaccinated from this. You could have a city full of skyscrapers and restaurants and coffee shops and skate parks awash in blood by next summer. It would be like a zombie movie. And the weirdest part about this vac, and they don't know what they're going to do. Merrick has said, you know, we don't know if we can have enough vaccines ready to go. And another thing with this outbreak is people are coming down with Ebola and they don't know where they got it from. Normally, you would have like one person go like, well, yeah, I was holding hands with that dude. And that's how I got Ebola. But now people are showing up and they're like, well, who, do you know anyone who died of Ebola? And they're, they're like, no, I don't know anyone who died of Ebola. So it may already getting spread in that droplet form. All it takes, too, I mean, this was the big controversy a couple of years ago, is for, it takes nine days someone get on a plane and go to another country, but they don't have enough vaccines to inoculate an entire city. They don't know how some people are catching it, which is very worrying. But the vaccine, I remember reading about this a couple of years ago, the vaccine itself. So Merrick is a company, and a company's goal is to make profit. Companies tend to have secondary goals. Walmart's goal is to make profit. And Sam Walton's goal, at least, you can argue whether or not Walmart's still about it, but Sam Walton's goal was to give customers low-price items. That was, I mean, he wanted to make money and keep the company going, but his secondary goal was to allow people to buy stuff at the lowest price possible. That's an admirable goal. Merrick, their main goal is to make money, and their secondary goal is to help people. But when you come, and and most corporations are like that. Amazon's like, hey, we want you to have access to all the entertainment you want to. But, you know, we also, our main goal is to make money. A little little capitalism side note there. Merrick said, listen, we can make this Ebola vaccine. But the truth of the matter is, is that Ebola is quite rare. So the amount of money that we put into making this vaccine, we have to recoup. Not just the research and development, but the making, producing the actual physical vaccine itself. It's quite rare. It'll take us forever to recoup a profit from making this. And then someone, some genius there, probably Max Brooks or George Romero, said, you know what else is rare that we have a vaccine for that we can stockpile, but it's so rare it doesn't really make it cost effective for us to make all this vaccine for? And and we can combine them together. And they're like, yes, Mr. Romero, what's your suggestion? And he goes, rabies. Rabies is a vaccine that is needed that we have, but it, does, it doesn't make sense for us to make a separate rabies vaccine. What if we took, this is 100% true, what if we took the rabies vaccine and the Ebola vaccine, combined them into a single vaccine so we can give it to either person? People are like, yay, clapping, having no... You ever wonder why people in zombie movies act like they've never seen a zombie movie? Because people in our planet act like they've never seen a zombie movie. Why would you invent something? Because remember, a vaccine tends to have 
a element of the disease in the vaccine. That might not hold true across all vaccines, but like the flu vaccine, they're like, oh yeah, it has a little bit of the flu vaccine. You might get sick. You might find a little, you're going to give me rabies if I have Ebola. Or if I have rabies, you're going to inject me with something that has Ebola in it? You've basically created a crazy blood-spewing monster who's just going to run around spitting blood at everybody and doesn't care because he has rabies. Why would you combine those two? Why don't you combine Ebola and, like, I don't know, anti-depression medicine or something that makes you sleepy? Anything else. I guess people who have depression don't want to be injected full of Ebola, but... Those are the two, those, uh, that's like at the beginning of I Am Legend, the movie. They invent the cure for cancer and it turns everyone into a vampire. I don't know if I would take that vaccine. And I don't know if I would hang out with anybody who took that vaccine. Because again, you've now created a crazy, a 28 days later, rage-infected monster. No. Put something else in that vaccine, Merrick. But 300,000 doses of that rabies slash Ebola vaccine is on its way to a major city in Africa. Okay, the last story we're going to talk about. It's funny because I heard about this story when I was a kid. Because I've always been reading this weird stuff. And as I was researching this, I realized the version I heard as a kid was heavily edited. So we're going to France. We will take... We'll hop in the carpenter copter because I want to get out of the Ebola city of Congo. We're going to fly above just right like they're... They're like running towards a helicopter. Get on, get on, get on. Many guns are out of ammo. Get on. That's not you making that noise. That's the zombies behind you. You hop into the helicopter. It's so funny. I get accused of racism all the time for this podcast. This isn't helping. But anyways, they're chasing us down. Jump in the helicopter. They're forming like a human pyramid to try to get us. Take off. Just as we start to see the nuke coming towards the city. Anyways, we're going to go to France. We're going to go back in time so we don't have to worry about zombies. I don't know why the helicopter made an airplane noise. But anyways, we land. And we're now in the 1700s. We're in 1700s France. And there we're going to meet. We see a guy. Walking down the... They had roads back then. Walking down the trail. That's a safe bet. He's walking down a place where there's no grass in a straight line. And his name is uh, Tar Rare. Tar Rare. Now, again, I had to talk about this during the India segment earlier. You should know by now that I can't pronounce my R's either. So if you don't know what I'm saying, he's a French guy. And his name is Tar Rare. Tar Rare. So anyways, Tar Rare... (sighs) Tarer, I don't know why I picked these stories to go all in the same episode. Tarer, it was this French guy. We look at him and we're like, that is a skinny man. That is a skinny man. He is of normal height, whatever that may be. He's 100 pounds. He looks to be 100 pounds. You're like, oh man, you need to eat something. 100 pounds for being in your 20s is quite slender. That's when he lifts up his shirt and billows of loose skin just... And like deflated balloon just kind of like slope towards the ground. And you notice that even though he's only in his 20s, his face is super wrinkly. He, he looks like a hundred pound man whose skin is just melted jello. Now, Tarer was a medical freak. There's a few other people who have this condition, but Tarer is the most notable. When he was a kid, his appetite was insatiable. He couldn't stop eating. And eventually, he literally, not literally, but he ate them out of house and home. He didn't eat the house. He wasn't like, you know what? Actually, he would have. We'll get to that in a second. He actually would have given the chance. And so his parents kicked him out because they're like, oh, we saw you eyeing the floorboards. They kick him out because they couldn't afford to keep him. And he ends up joining like a bunch of circus freaks. And his show was, let me eat whatever you got in your pockets. Let me, hey, Hey, you, what do you have in your pockets? And he's like, I I don't know, like a couple shillings. And he's like, well, that's weird. This is France. You should have francs. And he's like, oh, yes, I meant francs. So he'd eat the francs. And he goes, what do you have? And the person's like, I have this potted plant in my purse. And he's like, give it to me. He'd eat it. Now, his jaw didn't distend and he ate a whole pot, but um, he would eat cats. He'd be like, hey, 
hey, cat lady, can I borrow one of those? And she's like, uh, sure. Are you going to pet it? And he's like, Some, pet it from the inside? He'd rip its stomach open and eat the guts, and then he would eat everything but the bones, and then he'd throw up the, ugh, he'd throw up the fur and the skin. And then at that point, everyone would kind of just applaud. At one point, he was doing this act, and he got an obstruction in his stomach, and the other circus performers had to take him to the doctor. And the doctor was, like, fixing him up, and he goes, hey, you know, I do this act. This is a true story. He goes, you know, I do this act where I can eat anything. And the doctor's like, really? He's like, hey, let me eat your gold watch. He couldn't stop eating stuff. And the doctor said, if you ate my watch, I'm going to cut you open and get it out. To which I imagine Terrer, like, grabbed the collar of his shirt and went, gulp? But anyways, he couldn't stop eating stuff. Eventually, he joined the military, which considering that that life is so regimented, it seemed like a bizarre choice, but maybe just doing his civic duty. And he would eat all of his rations, and then he would do chores around the camp to eat other people's rations. And then he started eating food out of the garbage, and that's nothing compared to what's coming. Started eating food out of the garbage. And the army was like, dude, seriously. And when he'd eat, like all of his loose skin would inflate like a balloon. He could actually fill his body up with, up with food, and then as it would dissolve, his skin would get super loose again. And finally, there was this dude at the camp the commander and he goes this guy's driving me nuts but i have a plan i'm gonna make him swallow little like box wooden boxes with battle plans on them and then he'll just walk across enemy lines and no one will notice him because he just looks like a normal dude and then he'll poop out the plans to somebody else and so they do a test they give him a little wooden box and put a piece of paper in it and he swallows it and then a couple days later he poops it out or a couple hours later whatever he poops it out and the box was fine and they're like oh this plan's gonna work now, let me tell you a little bit more about Tarer. This was his description. He had an abnormally wide mouth and near invisible lips. Now, I don't think that meant they were like the invisible woman that you could see through him. I think they just meant that he had super, super thin lips. Like I said, his face was super wrinkly. His skin hung super low. His skin, like if you touched him, it was hot. He was hot to the touch. It's probably a big part of his metabolism. And he was described, this is a quote, He stunk to such a degree that he could not be endured within the distance of 20 paces. So just a super stink bag. You didn't want to be near him. And that was normal. When he ate, he smelled worse. He had constant diarrhea. Constant diarrhea. And that gives a new angle to the story of them like waiting around for him to poop out the box. And it's all (laughs) just like a huge puddle. And they're like... Okay, let's get a private in here to dig through this stuff, because I'm not. He had chronic diarrhea, and it was, and again, quote, fetid beyond all conception. So they should have had a poet in the room, because you hear that phrase, they should send a poet to space. They should have they should have had a poet. Uh, beyond all conception, beyond what great ideas lay out in the universe, they cannot use to describe the smell of his diarrhea. And I don't know, I don't know how this is possible, but they said that you could look at him and vapor, like stink lines came out of his skin. You could see a visible vapor around him. There's just the stench. Now let's go back to that plan about using him as a spy. (laughs) You want someone to walk across enemy lines. France was at war with Prussia at this point. You pick a guy who has big, big flabby cheeks, stinks from 20 meters away, has visible vapor lines coming off of him, and constantly has to stop to have diarrhea. Needless to say, the plan didn't really work. He eventually, when he went back, he's like, he didn't want to do any more army stuff, so he volunteered to go to hospital. The doctors were like, oh my god, this is amazing. We can't wait to see how this dude works. They tried curing him. One of the cures was soft-boiled eggs. Let's give him as many soft-boiled eggs as we can. And he's like, gulp, 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 gulp. Didn't work out too well. One of the things was they had a a meal spread, a table spread for 15 laborers who were working in the hospital at that time. So they had all this food laid out, and they go, hmm. The doctors are like, hmm, I wonder what will happen if we give him food that is set aside for 15 able-bodied men. He ate it all. He ate it all. He complained about hunger all the time. He was, If he wasn't eating, he was constantly exhausted. So it wasn't just like this circus freak, let me swallow anything. He was constantly hungry. He had to eat. That's why he was digging through the garbage. So they saw him eat all that food, and they're like, okay, okay, enough fun, guys. Let's go back to trying to cure him. And they would put him on these regulated diets. 
But the problem is, is that he wouldn't stick to him. He would break out of the hospital or just walk out of the hospital at night. And there was a butcher shop that, you know, they throw all their scraps in the dump and the garbage behind the butcher shop. I imagine it's like the lady in the tramp. There's just a bunch of spaghetti back there. He would go through that, but so would stray dogs. So he had to fight stray dogs for food every night just to get some extra food. In this hospital, because we're in the 1700s, bloodletting was a thing. They had a bloodletting ward. Hmm, you're sick. Let's take as much blood out of you as possible. That might cure you. He would drink their blood. He would go in there and he'd be like, glub, glub, glub. And you can imagine like a nurse was walking through the hospital and saw like a silhouette crouched over with like a hose in his mouth. And she's like, Tar Rare, what are you doing out of your room? And he's like, gulp. And then they caught him. No joke. Because he imagine having a hunger that's on the level of a heroin addiction. Like you have to eat. You have to eat. They caught him in the morgue trying to eat corpses. And they're like, ta rare. No, at that point, they were really concerned about. So the end of his hospital stay, the end of all the experiments ends like this. Terrare's in the hospital. And he's probably sitting there and he has like an odd shaped lump in his stomach. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. But okay, let me try to stick to the fact. (laughs) The fact, okay. The fact of the story is. The fact of the story is, Terrer is in the hospital, and it was a fully functional hospital. So they had, like, the bloodletting ward and the morgue and um, other stuff going on there, including a maternity ward. Oh, wait, this baby wouldn't be there because this baby was 14 months old, but they did have a maternity ward. So, not the maternity ward because this baby's too old. This baby's graduated. The baby's there for some checkup. French measles. They want to make sure the baby doesn't have French measles. So... But one day the mom's like, here, baby, 14-month-old baby, I'm going to set you down on this chair while I read this old-timey wood carving magazine. So she's like getting splinters reading this wood carving magazine. And she turns back, baby's gone. Baby's gone. Now, I don't know if that exact sequence of events happened either. The point is, is that Terrer was in a hospital and a 14-month-old baby went completely missing. They never, ever found the kid. And the fur they didn't go, oh, Terrer, this time. They're like, that dude ate a baby. That guy straight up ate a baby. And he took off. He ran out. That's the end of that story. I was like, there has to be another answer. It has to be that they found the baby later. But from all accounts, he ate a living baby. Which isn't far from, from the other stuff he's done. We know he's eaten live cats and live dogs. And he's tried eating humans. So, I mean... A- Babies kind of look like food. They look like uh, little little rolls. Now, I would never eat a baby, but they look puffy. And so, Terrer, as hungry as he is, he could just be like, ah, it'll probably taste like dinner rolls and marshmallows. I don't know. That's super disgusting. But anyways, actually, you think they would have found the bones because he doesn't eat that. He runs out of the hospital. Eventually, though, at age 26, died very, very young. He goes and he says... He goes to this other doctor and he's like, oh, hi, I'm Terrer. You might know me from the baby eating scandal, but I ate a gold fork a while ago and I think it's still in me and I'm super sick. Now, the doctor's looking at this saggy, fetid, gross diarrhea monster and he's thinking, you know, a guy who ate a gold fork, that's not the weirdest thing about you, but... Let's take a look. So he starts treating him and he goes, no, you don't have, you didn't, you you may or may not have eaten a golden fork, but you have tuberculosis, advanced tuberculosis. And Terrera's like, no, trust me, dude, I ate a gold fork. It's in my stomach. It really hurts. I've eaten tons of stuff, but for some reason that's not sitting well with me. Other than the fact that it's a four pronged metal object. He eventually does die though. And in his last moments, like the last couple hours of his life, 10 times the worst diarrhea. He was pooping out pus. Pus and blood-filled diarrhea. And then he dies. A fitting way to end to a man who had diarrhea his entire life. He had to tie, he had to one-up it. And so, um, one of the doctors who treated him at the baby-eating hospital came to this hospital because they called him up and they're like, hey, remember that baby-eating scandal? And he's like, oh yeah. We have that guy here. He says he ate a gold fork. And you can imagine the doctor at the other hospital, by that time, the phone's already like hanging off the desk and he's in his jalopy to get to this hospital or the, a horse because they didn't have cars back then but he to get there because he's like dude i need to find i want to find this guy because this guy was like a medical marvel and he gets there 
And the body's just laying there, and it's super stinky, and none of the doctors want to do an autopsy. And the baby Eaton Hospital doctor says, I'll do it. I need to find out what made this guy tick. So they cut him open. His throat cavity was so huge that if you opened his mouth, you could look down into his stomach. His body cavity was filled with pus. Like his liver was covered in pus and just like an ocean of mucus in there. And his stomach, all over the inside of his stomach were mass. And his stomach was huge, by the way, like his actual stomach cavity. But all over the inside of his stomach were these massive, gross, disgusting tumors. I don't, it wasn't in the description. They were gross and disgusting, but I'm sure they were. I don't think that's a stretch of the imagination. And no golden fork. So the question is, is, did he really eat the Golden Fork? Probably, for whatever reason, because he's Terrer. But did he poop it out at some point, or did his, was his stomach acid so intense it can actually melt metal or gold? I guess gold is a metal, but... That's the story of Terrer. Now, like I said, when I read the story when I was a kid, it was like, there's this goofy guy named Terrer. He'd eat anything. He was a circus performer, and he ate corks and screws, and once he even ate a cat. And then he turned the page and it's like about the two-headed wolf girl or something like that. Nothing about eating babies. Nothing about pus filled with diarrhea. None of that stuff. But I remembered that story as a kid looking through like Ripley's Believe It or Not or some crazy person, like crazy people in history book. They took out all the good stuff. That's why I found it for you guys on Dead Rabbit Radio. There we go. I like that take. Took me four tries. But we got it. It takes a while to warm up on Mondays. It's it's weird because I have those two days where I don't do anything. But I went and took a shower and I was like, I, I got to do it. It's my job. I got to do it. But I, we had a good one. I really like this episode. Now, now I like this episode. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. But I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>